Hey everybody, welcome here again tonight. Good to see you here. This is going to be a really exciting and interesting study as we continue talking about the new exodus. And last week we started off showing you that and explaining, first of all, that when somebody gets a really good handle on the book of Revelation, they will realize that it's not movies of the future. It's actually a compilation of Old Testament pictures used by God to show John, with John knowing what those scriptures referred to, knowing the setting, knowing that those historical events in the Old Testament actually happened, it would tell John what's going to happen in his future using those things as symbols. And what's so wonderful is that I don't know how many messages God has opened up to me about how Genesis begins everything and Revelation, of course, ends it. And we're in the new covenant with Revelation and that everything in Genesis is seen coming to a maturity in Revelation. The devil thought he was able to foil God's plan for man having dominion on the earth. And little did he realize God himself was going to come down in the flesh. Jesus Christ would be King of Kings and Lord of Lords as God and also as man and giving us the status of kings and priests with him. And that's why all of those Old Testament pictures are being used by God to speak to John about his future because there's like a repetition and that's what we've really highlighted through this series. This is part two and I'm going to dig even deeper into it tonight. But last week we talked about how that John, like Moses, when Moses was getting ready for the Exodus, John heard something behind him. Moses saw a burning bush and Moses literally had to turn and look to see the bush. And Revelation 1 shows us John turning and not seeing a burning bush, but something quite similar. A tree-shaped golden set of seven candlesticks with branches as candlesticks from an almond tree. It was a tree shape. And like the burning bush was on fire, and I am that I am was in the middle of the bush, Jesus was in the middle of the burning candlesticks shaped like a tree on fire because they were candlesticks shaped like branches. And then we continued and, and went on and how to the, the Passover lamb and its blood was put around the doorways in Egypt and that Passover lamb's blood broke the back of Pharaoh and the kingdom of Egypt came down and God delivered Israel from Egypt. And we talked about how Revelation 5, after chapter 2 and chapter 3 talk about the letters to the churches, chapter 4 opens up with heaven. And then I'm going to actually go back there and show you a few more details we didn't mention last week. But the lamb in chapter 5 redeems us by his blood just like the lamb redeemed Israel out of Egypt. So we're going to go on and continue this again tonight. And I want to start here. Just before we left off last week, we talked about these verses. But I, again, like I said, I'm going to pick up and bring even far more out of these verses than uh, in this next sequence of thoughts than we did last week. Watch this. In Revelation and 12, the first four verses, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now again, it's not movies of the future. This is just as symbolic as the mark of the beast is. It's just as symbolic as the new Jerusalem is. Everything in Revelation has a picture from the Old Testament being used as a symbol and is not to be meant literally, as, as he's seeing movies of the future. Now remember, the sun, moon, and the stars. This isn't a vision John saw. What other vision or dream is there in the Old Testament about the sun, moon, and the stars? Specifically, 12 stars, just like there is here. Joseph had a dream of him, his, his brothers. He would be the 12th, but his brothers would be 11. The sun and the moon his father and mother, bowing down to him. It was Israel. This represented Israel. So this woman speaks of Israel. She, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. 
So she's pregnant, ready to have a baby. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns. Now here's where we stopped and noticed that Pharaoh, he had a crown and you've seen pictures of it. It would go up and down the sides of his face and there was a serpent along with a falcon beside it. But the serpent, and that seems to be the most insidious part of it all and perhaps that's why the picture is parallel. But this dragon is said to be the old ancient serpent and that's the one from Genesis that went into the garden. And so this dragon, just like Pharaoh, went to devour, destroy that child from that woman that would be born, just like Moses was going to be born, and Moses was going to deliver Israel from Egypt in the first Exodus. But in the new Exodus, it's not Moses that's the deliverer, it's Jesus. And Jesus, just like Moses, was born in a time when Herod, thought to massacre the children because he couldn't get a hold of the one child. The wise men had informed him that the child was born. Herod's uh, scholars informed him it would be at Bethlehem. And so putting the message together, he sent the wise men to go to Bethlehem and bring back the report of exactly where the child was in Bethlehem. But praise God, God stepped in. And I'll show you that in a moment. But here, just like Pharaoh, and just like Herod, ready to devour this child, the dragon is ready to devour this child that's going to be born. And it has seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns on his heads, and so forth and so on. But I, I really want you to notice this part. There's the vision. The woman, the dragon, is ready to devour that baby. But praise God, God steps in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, there's Pharaoh's massacre in Exodus 1 and 16. He said, when you do the office of a midwife, he commanded all the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools. If it be a son, you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. And in Exodus 1 and 22, Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, every son that is born, you shall cast into the river, the Nile, and every daughter you'll save. So the same thing occurred at Christ's birth with Herod and Jesus being born in Matthew 2 and 16. Herod slew all the children that were born in Bethlehem, trying to find that deliverer, just like Pharaoh did. Now, in Exodus 2, verse 5 to 6, of course, G uh, Moses floated in that little bulrush ark into Egypt, and the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter took him and claimed him as her own. Just like Jesus in Matthew 2 and 13 to 14 went into Egypt when Joseph was told by God to flee and take the child to Egypt. And so you're seeing this in Revelation of all places. And, and he was told to flee into Egypt specifically. And so there's a picture of Moses at that time. Now, here's where we're going to get into more detail of what I didn't mention last week. And it's going to really bring home. Once you see this series of patterns of what's happening between Exodus and Revelation... By the time we get to the mark of the beast, you're almost going to laugh at what you've been hearing people say on the videos and on the internet of what the mark actually is. You're, you're going to be so much aware of the parallel between Exodus and Revelation that you're going to know, okay, how does Exodus bring it out? And how does that give me insight about the mark of the beast? <laughs> I, I almost fell off my chair when I realized this. Exodus 24 and 12. The Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount. Now they're already in the Exodus. He's gone and led them to Mount Sinai. And God says, come up to me in the mount. Now we've showed you. Moses saw God in the burning bush. John saw Jesus in the burning tree-shaped candlestick. Moses had the Passover lamb. There's the Passover lamb, Jesus, whose blood redeemed us. The, the, there's a massacre of the children when, when they're born trying to get Moses and trying to get Jesus. So the parallel, all these things are mentioned in Revelation. And just like Moses was told to come up to the mount, in Revelation 4, after this, after the seven letters were written and, and God dictated to him the seven letters, behold, I looked, behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Picture a trumpet talking, the sound of a trumpet which said, come up hither, just like Moses was told, come up to me in the mount. 
John's told, come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, watch this carefully because this comes up again in Revelation. Moses would be given two tables of stone, a law and commandments. Keep that in mind. Now look what they saw. In Exodus 32 and 15, Moses turned and went down from the mount and there were two tables of the testimony in his hand. And look what it describes them as. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. Now, I'm going to blow away a sacred cow here. <laughs> you ever, have you seen the Ten Commandments? And ever since the movie The Ten Commandments came out with Charlton Heston, everybody's been thinking that these tables of stone, maybe it's because they, they think the word tables means they're gigantic, but tomb-sized uh, gravestone sized tablets with the Ten Commandments, big, huge things. Notice the two tables of, of testimony were in his hand. His single hand held both of them. It, it, it probably would be more understandable to us if we realized that tables is like tablets, two tablets of the testimony. But anyhow, the tables were written on both their sides, one side and on the other. Now look at Revelation 5. When I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. So look at all the comparisons. They both turn around. They see the Lord in the burning bush or burning candlestick shaped like a tree. The Passover lamb. One's told to come up hither. John's told to come up and he goes into heaven. And, and then Moses has two tables of stone written on both sides with the law. And John sees a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Did you ever notice that before? Isn't that amazing? Now, the sequence of furniture way back in Exodus that God spoke to Moses to build for the tabernacle, which we learn in Hebrews 9 was a pattern of the tabernacle in heaven. See, Moses was given a pattern. It even said Moses build it after the pattern of things which are in heaven. And, and in heaven, these things are there. So the same sequence follows John's sequence of sights that he saw in Revelation 4 in heaven. Look at this. Moses is told the first thing to build in Exodus 25 verses 10 to 22. And, and Moses is, is being instructed from the inside of the tabernacle outward. And the deepest thing in the tabernacle would be the Ark of the Covenant. And just like the Ark of the Covenant has a mercy seat, that's where the glory of God was on the mercy seat. That represents the throne of God. And the first thing John sees is the throne of God in Revelation 4 and 2. Now, watch the sequence. The throne of God corresponds to the Ark of the Covenant. Then there was the table of showbread in Exodus 25. Now, notice the verses that I'm outlining. Verses 23 to 30, we stopped with the ark at verses 10 to 22. So what's after 22 is verse 23. So you're seeing the sequence here. And look at this, Revelation 4 and 2. Well, in Revelation 4 and 4, there were 24 seats, table and chairs. You got the table of showbread with the chairs, the seats. And then the third thing, again, look at the sequence, Exodus 25 and 31, the candlestick that we already described as Seven branches, like a tree. Well, there were seven lamps burning with fire. Look at the verse, five, after the 24 seats in verse four. Just like the candlestick was after the table of showbread, the seven lamps are after the 24 seats. And Moses and John are seeing the same sequence. It was, it just hit me. I never heard anybody preach that. I was studying it and the Lord was showing me, look at, look at, look at this. And I said, look how Revelation and Exodus are parallel. And then Moses is told to build a barrier of curtains. And then there's a veil that's mentioned with the carabims that were embroidered in on it. And Exodus 26 verses 1 to 10 and chapters 30 and verses 31 to 37, show you this veiling and the cherubims and so this barrier. What's the fourth thing John sees? He sees a barrier too, but it's a crystal sea. He can't get across. And in chapter five, when Jesus the lamb goes over to that throne, 
It's like he was walking on water in heaven, like he walked on water on the earth. Because before the throne, there was this crystal sea barrier. And just like the cherubims were sewn into the veil, there were four beasts at this barrier of the crystal sea. Revelation 4, verses 6 to 11. Now, look at this. In Ezekiel 1, the cherubim are described as having four faces, face of a man, lion, ox, and eagle. Well, in Revelation 4 and 7, it describes these four beasts that are with this, that are associated with this crystal sea barrier. And the first beast was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third like a man, and the fourth like a flying eagle. The same faces. Isn't it amazing that Exodus and Revelation has Moses and John being shown the same sequence of events, but John was seeing the real things in heaven, where Moses saw a model of the ark, a model of the throne with the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Clearly, Exodus is parallel with Revelation, but you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> and then in Revelation 4, verses 6 to 9, Actually, that's chapter 5, verses 6 to 9. The lamb was slain, whose blood redeemed the saints. And he goes and takes that book that was on both sides and opened the seals. Now, Moses was able to get the tablets from God on Sinai after the Passover lamb's blood was shed. And he struck that blood on the doorways back in Egypt to redeem Israel from bondage. Well, that's why the lamb is slain, but he's standing. And the lamb goes and gets that book like Moses Jesus it was even said prophesied by Moses a prophet like unto me unto him shall you hearken and Jesus was the one Moses was pointing to and isn't it beautiful to know that when Jesus appeared in transfigured glory on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17 that Moses was there and, and they spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. We showed you last week that the Greek word for decease is exodus. Here Moses was talking about Jesus, about Jesus' exodus, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Oh my, he would be the lamb whose blood was shed. Little did Moses realize back at the time in Egypt that he would be with Jesus century, 1,500 years later on the mountain, and Jesus was not only the new Moses, like the deliverer, but he was actually the Passover lamb as well. Praise God. And then, of course, plagues are found in both the Egyptian ordeal and all through the seals, the trumpets, the vials, and even the thunders of the book of Revelation. By the way, I don't have written on here the thunders, but there were seven seals, seven trumpets, seven thunders, and seven vials. Now, I've even tried this. I looked on the internet to see what people would think the seven thunders are. And remember, John was told, John, when he heard what the seven thunders said, God said, don't write it. Don't write it. Now, we don't all together know why. But let me just warn you as a man of God, don't believe anything anybody ever tells you about what those seven thunders are because they don't know. John was told not to write it down. So uh, let's continue. So Moses goes to the throne in Egypt, like we've said. Now we're back to Revelation chapter 12 now. So she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations in Revelation 12. And her child was caught up to the throne, to God in his throne. You see, Jesus died and resurrected and went right to the throne. If you wonder who this child is, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Praise God. And the biggest prophecy that you'll ever read in the Old Testament, and the reason I call it the biggest, is because it's the one that's quoted more times by Jesus, by the apostles, in so many epistles, in so many, even in the Gospels. And here we see it symbolized in the book of Revelation. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That prophecy right there was quoted more than any other Old Testament prophecy in the New Testament. The New Testament quoted it far more than any other prophecy. So after that ascension of Jesus, 
persecution hit the church, just like the Hebrews in Egypt were persecuted after Moses had gone to that place of dominion in Egypt. Now, 40 years later, Moses comes to free Israel from Egypt, right? He saw the burning bush. We talked about that. 40 years after the cross, something happened too. The time of the church's exodus from Jerusalem. Because Jesus had prophesied, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of there. And Eusebius, several hundred years ago, referred to that and said, that's why in A.D. 70, when the Romans came down and besieged and surrounded and starved out Jerusalem, not a Christian was there because they remembered what Jesus said. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, hightail it out of there. And you know what's interesting? People think those scriptures aren't fulfilled yet. Well, I'm mighty glad that the early church, when that year came, didn't believe it wasn't for their day because if they had, they wouldn't have heeded that Jerusalem surrounded with their armies and they would have been destroyed with the many Jews, the hundreds of thousands that were. But praise God, those disciples back then knew it was for their day and it was proved right. So here it is in Revelation 12 and 6. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there. A thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three and a half years. That's 42 months. Did you know how long Jerusalem was surrounded and starved out by Rome in AD 70? Three and a half years right to the penny, just like the prophecy said. And not a Christian perished because they had fled and God had taken them into the wilderness, just like he took Israel into the wilderness. They'd be there for 40 years, but the church was there for three and a half years. And they were spared that judgment, just like Revelation said. You see, people don't know history. I, I had never heard anyone preach this to me way back in the day. I, I heard... Um, you know, this is all in the future. This is going to happen. Watch out because Jerusalem is going to get surrounded with an armies. No one taught me that, wait a minute, this happened in AD 70 when Jerusalem was surrounded. And all the Christians got out of there just like Jesus warned them to because when he talked to them in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21, he looked into their eyes and he said, you are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now, if he was talking with me and he said, you are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, I'd say, I'm going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. I'm not going to think of people 2,000 years after I'm dead. I'm going to think me. And then he said, you will see earthquakes in diverse places. I'd think I would be the one that would see that. And he said in Matthew 16 at the very last verse, some of you standing here will not taste death till you see the Son of Man coming. And then we always think of the rapture and the second coming when we hear of the Son of Man coming. But... In Matthew 21 and 40, Jesus said, those wicked husbandmen in the parable I just showed you, that the master sent servants to go get the grapes from the vineyard, representing the prophets of the Old Testament that went to tell Israel to give their fruit of praise to God. And then they took them and beat them. And then the Lord said, I'll send my son. And they said, this is the son. Let's take him. And they took him outside the city and killed him. And that was Jesus, the son of God, taken just out the gates of Jerusalem and crucified. Jesus said in Matthew 21 and 40, when the Lord of the vineyard cometh, when the Lord cometh, what will he do to those wicked husbandmen? And then looking down into their eyes, those Pharisees and Sadducees said with their own lips, he'll miserably destroy those wicked husbandmen and give his vineyard to another. And Jesus said, this is what's going to happen to you. And then they perceived that he spoke of them. So in that instance, the coming of the Lord had nothing to do with the rapture, nothing to do with the second coming. It was a coming to destruct, to destroy rather, those wicked husbandmen over the vineyard called Jerusalem. And that is a coming of destruction. That's how many are thankful the Lord's coming. The, the resurrection's going to happen. The trumpet's going to sound and we're out of here. But that's not what Jesus was talking about in Matthew here. He was talking about a destruction that the Christians would have to get out of that city 
If they wanted to survive. If this was talking about a resurrection and a rapture in Matthew 24, why didn't he just say, you guys just stay put because you're going to be raptured out of this world when Jerusalem's surrounded with armies? <laughs> All the people that believe the rapture is going to happen before a seven-year tribulation, they should find that there if they're going to keep on believing that doctrine. But Jesus didn't say, stand there and wait for the trumpet to sound. He said, get out of there. And that happened in AD 70. Oh my. But let's go on. Jerusalem was under siege and destroyed for a period of three and a half years. The church escaped because they listened to his words. When you see Jerusalem surrounded, get out. And there's the cup of God's wrath poured upon Jerusalem because they crucified the Lord. And somebody say, well, Mike, that does fit with what happened in AD 70. But can it also be about the future? I don't know how many times people have asked me that. And I said, no, it can't. Because Jesus said there'll be tribulation such as never was, nor ever shall be. So if that tribulation back then is going to be repeated, well, the tribulation 2,000 years ago, there couldn't be anything greater in the future. So that throws the future out. And if it's tribulation in our future that's greater than anyone that was in the past, then that throws the 70 AD one out. So you can't have both. You got to just accept what Jesus said. Now, just like in Egypt, Satan frantically tried to stop the church. In Revelation 12 and 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought. The dragon fought in this war, and, and God threw them out of heaven. And then he said, now is come salvation and the kingdom of our God. Did you ever pray, thy kingdom come? Did you ever pray, thy kingdom come? Well, God's kingdom came. Praise God. And we're rulers and we're kings and priests. Don't think of worldly kingdoms. Jesus said, that's the kingdoms of this world. They try to get over each other. That's not what my kingdom is about. And yet that's what we think about when we think of the kingdom. So it couldn't have happened yet. We're not mayors and presidents and prime ministers and kings and queens. Yes, we are kings and queens. We're kings and priests. And it's a spiritual kingdom. Amen. But that salvation is actually what deliverance means salvation delivered and there's the war and so i'm moving quickly because i want to get to where we are they overcame him by the blood the church had faith in the blood of christ and they endured that persecution until the day they heard the lord say when that jerusalem is surrounded get out of there and they got out and our troubles will also be solved today if we have faith in the blood of jesus but let's move on and I'm moving ahead. We talked about some of these points last week. So I want to go on. You can watch last week and get the more details. We find out that in the book of Revelation, there's not only the dragon against the church, but there's Hagar against Sarah, so to speak. There's like woman against woman. The harlot woman against the pure woman clothed with the sun. It was old Jerusalem persecuting new Jerusalem. Hagar and her son were cast out, so to speak. Jerusalem... The natural Jerusalem in that day, they weren't serving God. It's like it's going to be cast out. And then in 67 to 70 AD, the old Jerusalem was removed and out of the way, just like Hagar was gone from Abraham's house. Just like Cain was against Abel and, and Saul was against David, Esau against Jacob. It's the old against the new and it's flesh against spirit. And let me just move on quickly here. You'll see a lot of these details from last week. But look at this. Remember in Revelation 7 and 3, like the blood on the doorways of Egypt that saved the Hebrews, before the wrath of God came on Egypt, we read this parallel with Revelation. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Now, I'm coming up about the mark of the beast here. Everybody thinks of the mark of the beast when they think of Revelation. I don't know how that became the big thing. If you ever explain to anybody what you think of Revelation, what's the first thing they're going to ask? What do you think is the mark? <laughs> well, look how many times a seal in the forehead, like the mark of the beast is going to be in the foreheads, according to Revelation 13, is mentioned in Revelation. The, God had a seal for his servants in their foreheads. Now, the mark of the beast is mentioned once going on people's foreheads. And then after that, it's referred to everyone that had the mark in their forehead, cast in the lake of fire. 
Well, the seal of God is mentioned far more times than the mark of the beast. It's in Revelation 7 and 3. It's in Revelation 7 and 4. And he heard the number and so forth. And there's, there it is, the seal of God going onto their foreheads. And wait till you see the scriptures that deal with it. But the seal of God on their foreheads is mentioned far more times in Revelation than the mark of the beast on foreheads. Why do people always stress the negative mark of the beast? In fact, a lot of believers don't even know several times the seal of God on the forehead is even mentioned. And so, let's... There's a lesson I taught earlier last week. We'll get into detail. Watch that after. But... Let's go up to the mark of the beast here. So when Moses came down from the mount with those two tablets, like Revelation 5 has the lamb coming with the sealed book written on both sides, God informed him, Moses, the people have made a golden calf and are worshiping it. Now, watch the pattern in Revelation. Here it is in Exodus 32. When the people saw Moses delayed to come down, they gathered themselves to Aaron, make us gods, let them go before us. The man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, this Moses, who knows what happened to him. So Aaron said, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, daughters, and bring them to me. All the people break off the golden earrings and brought them to Aaron. And look what happens. He received them and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a golden, a molten calf. These be thy gods, Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. He made proclamation, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early. They burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and people came down, and then they rose to play. Uh, it's like you get the sense that when they, they went to lustful acts and, and ungodliness. And um, the Lord said to Moses, get down, because your people, which you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted it's like he's disowning them already. Moses, they're your people. They have turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. They've made them a molten calf and worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, what do you think corresponds to that in the book of Revelation? Think about it. There's an image of the beast in Revelation. Isn't that amazing? Revelation 13 and 14. Have you ever made that connection before? They worshiped a golden calf in the Exodus, just like they're worshiping the image of a beast in Revelation. Now, if we hadn't had enough parallels already, Revelation 13 and 14, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And then when Moses came down, he demanded a separation from the worship of the image of the beast, the golden cow and the Levites. Remember the Levites came out and stood with Moses. They stood with Moses as Moses had come down from the mountain Sinai. Exodus 32 and 6, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Boy, a lot of people don't like that. A man saying, if you're on God's side, come to me. Folks, God put men as leadership in the church. I'll just say that in this message. The others, I can get into a lot more in another night. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. After we read of people worshiping the image of the beast in Revelation, and then wearing the mark, we read of another group standing with the lamb on a mountain, just like the Levites came and stood with Moses. Remember, Moses was a foreshadow of the deliverer, Jesus. And I looked in Revelation 14 and 1, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, like Moses had just come from Mount Sinai, with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now there's the seal of God again, from chapter 7, and it's written on their foreheads, believers' foreheads. <laughs> now, when you consider the mark of the beast, or his name or his number, in chapter 13, on the foreheads of the worshipers of the image of the beast, we read a very interesting connection with the law of Moses. Watch this. Now we're going to be able to show you 
Not, I'm not looking in the National Enquirer, which some of these people might as well be looking in when they preach the messages they preach. <laughs> and you know the reputation the National Enquirer has. Um, the Star, Vogue, Cosmopolitan, you know. I'm going to the Bible to show you the parallel. Now, you've seen an undeniable parallel so far with all of Exodus and Revelation in the story of Moses. Obviously, if there's any similarity here with something on the forehead in Exodus, that's going to give us insight about what the nature of the mark of the beast is in Revelation. And I'll tell you this, it ain't a computer chip. It ain't a COVID-19 vaccine. <laughs> You'll laugh that you even considered those things when you watch how the Bible interprets the Bible. Oh, Deuteronomy 6 and 2, God's chapter of the law and the commandments that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, Israel, observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel! The Lord our God is one Lord. How many love reading that phrase? He is one. Our God is one, folks. And thou shalt love, watch it, love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And he says, these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. Now, you know what heart, soul, and might represent? Spirit, soul and body a man is made up of a spirit a soul and a body so he says number one i want these words to be in your heart that's the first one and notice the greek word in revelation for mark of the beast mark means engraving and etching thou shalt teach them diligently back to deuteronomy teach your children talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when thou risest and thou shalt after telling them to put them in in, it, in their hearts Bind them for a sign on your hand. There's the body. You got the spirit and the body. Put, put the word in your heart. Now, bind it on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. What's that mean, Mike? The forehead represents the will. I'm going to show you scripture to prove that. The will. Your hand is your actions. Your forehead is your will. Your body, your soul your heart hallelujah watch in revelation 13 and 16 he causeth all both small and great rich and poor to receive a mark that word mark is engraving in etching in their right hand or forehead just like the law of god would be on their hand and forehead now is that a coincidence after we saw moses and john turn around and burning bush and burning candlestick tree uh passover lamb Revelation, Passover lamb. Uh, even coming out of Egypt, the massacre, trying to nail Moses and the massacre against Jesus. And they both go into Egypt. And all of this is in Revelation. The woman, clothed with the sun, the dragon's ready to devour that child. But he goes to the throne and Moses escapes and goes into Egypt and he goes to the throne. And then eventually, uh, he's in a place of leadership rather. And then you see all of this parallel. You see the image of the beast. You see God saying, Moses, come up here in the mount. And God says, John, come up here into heaven. And they see the law written on both sides and the, the, the sealed book written on the inside and on the backside. And then there's an image of the beast in both instances. And then there's even something on the forehead and something on the hand in both instances. Now tell me this. Was the law of God in Deuteronomy a computer chip? Was the seal of God on the foreheads of 144,000 people a COVID vaccine? <laughs> Was the seal of God on the 144,000 with their father's name written on their foreheads a computer chip? Nonsense. What you're seeing is Satan's answer to God's law because God's law would be in their heart as frontlets between their eyes representing my will, God. I'm committed to keep that law. On your hand, my actions will obey that law. That's what the forehead and what the hand mean. Hallelujah. And the devil has his answer for that. He's got his lawlessness. 
God's law, Satan's lawlessness. You're committed to do your own thing. You're not taking a commandment from God. You're committed to do it. The commitment on the forehead, the doing on their hand. You're committed to do this ungodliness. That is the reality of what the mark of the beast. It's not a computer chip. Nothing's going on anybody's forehead according to prophecy. Nothing's literally going on their hands. It's all biblical imagery. And it's Satan's answer to God's law. How much more plain can it get when you compare and go through the scriptures with Exodus and Revelation compared? Now remember, Mark was an etching. The Ten Commandments were etched into the tables of stone, engraving. But the devil has his etching too. And he wants people to put his lawlessness in their foreheads, on their will, in their hands, and in their hearts. And associated with the law being obeyed from their hearts, with their soul and might, we see a connection to the soul being represented by the forehead. The might represented by the right hand in your soul. And with all your might, God said, the devil does it with his too. These are Hebraic metaphors, folks, for soul and might or body. They indicate your total allegiance to the law of God or your total allegiance to the devil. Satan's answer is the mark in the right hand and forehead. Now that's letting the Bible interpret the Bible. And watch this. After Moses called for people to stand by his side, and remember the lamb had the 144,000 stand with him, and instead of the mark of the beast in their foreheads, they had the seal of God in their foreheads. Is that seal a computer chip? Is that a vaccine for the 144,000? Where is Satan's vaccine or Satan's computer chip is in chapter 13. You see, you have to be consistent with what you're going to do with what a seal in the forehead means. If it's not, if it's spiritual, if it's it's not literal with the 144,000 name, no one's going to write and inscribe or tattoo the name of God in people's foreheads for them to be the 144,000. Any more than this mark of the beast is something like that. You've got to be consistent. But see, it's so sensational. It's, it's what's in the news now. And the whole history of earth rotates around our belly buttons. And all prophecy points to us today when they had things far worse than what we've ever dreamed we're going through right now in history all along. But this is happening in North America, so it must be Bible prophecy. We don't care if worse things happen in other nations overseas through the centuries. That couldn't be prophecy because it's not the United States or North America. <laughs> Excuse my sarcasm. In Exodus 32 and 28, the children of Levi did according to the word of the Lord and there fell. Now notice, just like Moses had people come to his side and then there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Look at what Revelation said in verse 7 of chapter 14. After they were with the lamb on Mount Sinai, Mount Zion rather, with the seal of God in their foreheads. I heard a voice saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made heaven, not an image of a beast. Worship him that made the earth, the sea, the fountains of the waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Notice the words, there fell of the people that day, about 3,000 people that worship the golden calf. Well, just after the mark of the beast and the worship of the image of the beast, there fell Babylon. It's fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in their forehead or hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God that's poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. In Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, did you ever notice this about the forehead with God's people? The Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city and through the midst of Jerusalem, Ezekiel, and set a mark. Actually, he was not talking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel saw him talking to this messenger with an ink horn. Set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And Ezekiel just wept and wept. So they had computer chips back in Ezekiel's day. And they were put on the foreheads of people. But these are godly people 
they sigh and cry for the abomination. Look, literally, I, I couldn't believe, I believed that it was a computer chip at one point. I couldn't believe it was something like they're saying now, a vaccine of all things. In Revelation 9 and 4, it's just not in chapter 7. Chapter 14 in Revelation 13. Revelation 9, it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor other, any tree, the tomb of the locusts, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Look how many times God seals in the forehead. And if you really go back to Genesis, you find Cain being marked in his forehead. God set a mark on Cain. And that was a warning. Stay away from him. And just like that, God sets a mark on the people of God's forehead. Stay away from them. You're not going to have the wrath come on them. And in Revelation 7 and 3, there is it again. Sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And in John 6 and 27, watch this. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, and which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. What could it be? 2 Corinthians 1 and 22, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now we're finding out the seal of God. Ephesians 1 and 13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You know what the seal of God in the forehead is? It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the seal of God's spirit of promise. Hallelujah. God's people with the Holy Ghost, they're going to be led by the spirit. They're going to be directed. They're not going to go under any wrath of God. And that happened in the first century. They heard the word of the Lord and the spirit and the word agree. And the word from Jesus told them, you flee when Rome comes. And the spirit prompted them, look, Jerusalem's being surrounded. Get out of there. Hallelujah. Ephesians 4 and 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And the devil's got his spirit on the lives of people that don't believe. His mark, his seal. You've got to let the Bible interpret the Bible. And this is what you realize. And so, as history shows, Rome destroyed Jerusalem after Jerusalem used Rome to destroy and slay the Lord on the cross. Pilate, if you don't crucify him, you're not a friend of Caesar. Well, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. And all through the book of Acts, they're still working with Rome to persecute the church. But one day, Rome threw that harlot city, Jerusalem, off his back. And then when she was burned with fire, like Jerusalem was burned with fire by Rome, and smashed, the Bible says in Revelation 18 and 24, in her, in that harlot, was found the blood of all those shed on the earth. The blood shed from all those slain on the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 23, Jerusalem, upon you is going to come all the blood shed on the earth. And that's the exact thing Revelation 18 and 24 says about the harlot. You know what it was? Like I said, it was woman against woman. It was harlot against pure virgin bride. It was old Jerusalem against new Jerusalem. And you might say, wait a minute, Mike, new Jerusalem, that's a cube-shaped city coming out of the sky. No, that cube-shaped city is a symbol of the church. The church is the bride. When Revelation said, John, you want to see the bride? Yeah, he took me up to a mountain, John said, and I saw a cube-shaped city coming down, adorned like a bride. The building in the city is not a bride of God. That is a symbol of the church. That's the bride. Jesus said, you are a city built on a hill that can't be hid. Isaiah said, people will bow their knees to you, people of God, and they will say, you're a city not forsaken. They're going to bow at your feet and they're going to call you a city not forsaken. Just like the church is in the building, the city's not an actual metropolis. It's not a cube-shaped building coming out of the sky. It's a symbol of the church because the holiest of holies was shaped like a cube. 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. And the new Jerusalem is 144,000 by 140, or 12,000 rather, by 12, by 12,000. A cube-shaped holiest of holies is a symbol of the church. And when the church is called the temple of God in Corinthians chapter 6, 
Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The word temple in Greek is nehos. And that's not just outer court, holy place and holiest of holies. That's holiest of holies alone. The church is the holiest of holies. Hallelujah. And so Rome destroyed Jerusalem. And in Revelation 17 and 16, the 10 horns which thou sawest upon the beast, they'll hate the whore. They'll make her desolate and naked. She was riding the beast earlier, but the beast throws her off. She was directing him. She was pulling the reins like Jerusalem, the, the religious leaders were pulling Pilate and were conducting Rome to kill Jesus and then to go after the Christians in the book of Acts. Well, this beast threw her off. They, they'll hate her, make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire because God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. Rome fulfilled God's will. It was supposed to be the crucifixion. The church would go through persecution. But then God said, okay, now Rome, throw that Jerusalem off your back and burn her with fire. And in AD 70, did Rome ever burn Jerusalem with fire? Now, where do we go now? Church, let's go off to the world. In Revelation 10, verse 10, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, John said. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. I got a rage inside of my spirit. The spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord, searching the inward parts of the belly, the belly and the spirit. He said unto me, you must prophesy again, John, before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. If you read Ezekiel 4 and Ezekiel 5, Ezekiel ate that book too. And it was sweet in his mouth, but it burned in his spirit. And he was to prophesy. Oh, hallelujah. There's only one message to all the world, folks. Notice what this, what John was told. You prophesy, you preach to many people, nations, tongues, and kings. What message were we supposed to preach to people, nations, tongues, all nations? There's only one. In Luke 24, verses 45 to 49, then opened he their understanding. Jesus opened the apostles' understanding just before he left this world in the ascension to sit on that throne that they might understand the scriptures. He said to them, thus it is written, thus it behooved Christ to suffer, rise from the dead the third day and repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things and behold, I send the promise. Repentance, remission of sins in his name. And he said, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you, but you tarry in the city of Jerusalem. Notice he told them, preach his name among all nations. That is what John symbolized by eating that book and prophesying to those nations. Hallelujah, God. In his name, folks. And in Acts 2.38, after the Holy Ghost promise was poured out, they were in Jerusalem and he said, wait in Jerusalem till you get the power. Then they preached exactly what Jesus told them to preach. The little words the little known words, the often mentioned words of Jesus in Luke 24, preach repentance and remission of sins in my name. Peter didn't ignore it. Peter didn't overlook it. It wasn't little heard to Peter. He said, repent. Just like Jesus said, repentance should be preached. Then remission of sins. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In the name. Did you notice remission in the name? Just like Luke 24, remission of sin should be preached in his name. And then the promise, remember he talked about the promise? And he said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise. Isn't that powerful? The promise is unto you, to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hallelujah. Whew. We have gone from Genesis to the book of Acts to Revelation. We stopped, talked about Deuteronomy and Exodus. Amen. We went into the Gospels in Matthew 24, and we showed you an undeniable parallel between the Exodus and the book of Revelation. Why? Because what was the end of the book of Revelation? I talked about it a bit. Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. And what was the end of the Exodus journey? 
You're going into the land of Canaan. You're going to find a city that I choose to put my name there. And that city became known as Jerusalem. But folks, earthly Jerusalem is with the old covenant. And it's old Jerusalem. But we've got a new covenant now. And that's what Revelation is all about. The changeover from the old to the new. It's not about the end of the church age. It's about the beginning. Hallelujah. The new Jerusalem is the church. Hebrews 12 and 22 says, you are come. It's not going to happen way off. You are come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn, innumerable company of saints, just saints, and to the blood of those. Oh my, folks, we're there. Is there trouble ahead? You must through much tribulation into the kingdom of heaven. There will always be trouble. And then is it going to get bad? Well, the enemy is going to take the nations and encamp around the church. There'll be an effort of a one world government because the enemy is going to get all nations to come against the church. But I want you to know this. It's not going to be getting all nations so that they can solve the world's problems. It's going to be get all the nations to come against the church. Church Satan against God is the whole issue happening behind the scenes. So we need to make sure we hold on to Jesus Christ. 